Well, we're journeying with uh, uh, Jesus, according to Mark, and Jesus has been moving around. Have y'all noticed that a lot? Jesus is like, he's been burning it up all over, back and forth across the lake, all around everywhere. He's been at the Tyre and Sidon, and now he's been in Capernaum, and he's been confronted by the Pharisees and other folks here and there. And today he's going to move on from Capernaum, and he's going to go across the Jordan River out into the countryside of Judea, and he's going to again be confronted by some Pharisees. Because remember now, Jesus is on that trek in Mark towards Jerusalem. He frames it a little differently than Luke and Matthew do, but it's the same path that Jesus is on now, uh, headed towards uh, Jerusalem. And so for us as his disciples, what we want to hear today, and what I want you to listen for today in the reading and in the message is, there's, there's three parts that speak to us. The first one is hardened hearts. The second one is, what does God say? What was God's plan? And the third is, human interference. So in today's reading, hear those things when they pop up, the hardened hearts, what God said, and human interference. And we'll talk about that some more. We're going to read out of the book of Mark chapter 10. Um, We're going to pick up in verse 2. The reason why we're skipping verse 1, because verse 1 just simply says Jesus left there and went to Judea and already told you that. So uh, 10 verse 2 through 10, hear the reading. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, Jesus replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you that that law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them, them male and female. For this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. Amen. Okay. Now, what I learned when I was preparing for this week is that most preachers don't like to preach this section because of the divorce. And because divorce has been so rampant in in our our modern world, uh, there's almost nobody in any given congregation that's not affected by it one way or another. uh, uh, And so they don't want to hear about it from the preacher, because the preacher didn't walk a mile in their shoes, and I get that. But Jesus isn't speaking about modern divorce. He's speaking about a living set of circumstances that's going to point to something. And I think that when we read these scriptures, if we just hear the divorce part and tune out, which most people do, just okay, then we miss what Jesus is speaking to. And that's what I want to bring to your attention today. What Jesus is speaking to is what these Pharisees were talking about when he says, what did Moses tell you? Because he knew they were trying to trick him, right? That's what the Pharisees were always trying to do, was to trick Jesus into saying something that either proved that he wasn't all that stuff or that he would say something that would offend the Roman authorities or somebody else to get him in trouble, okay? They were always trying to trick him. Every question was a trick from from the Pharisees. He knew they didn't really care about divorce one way or the other. So when they asked him, he said, so what did Moses tell you? He said, oh, actually, did you hear me say, he said, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses wrote, they didn't say Moses commanded. They said, Moses wrote that a man could give a certificate of divorce to his wife and send her away. The man could do it. Just write a note, wife, you're gone. 
I don't love you anymore. I don't like the way you look. I don't like the way you cook. That dinner you cooked last night was terrible. And it was the eighth night in a row. You know, whatever. But what Jesus was speaking to wasn't the divorce part, folks. He's speaking to what happens to divorce women in those, those days. A woman who was divorced in those days would be a woman single with her kids with no visible means of support. They would be ostracized by the community. They would be shunned. They wouldn't be welcome in social circles. They wouldn't be welcome in the temple. They would consider to be unclean. There's all kinds of things that would be happening that they wouldn't necessarily consider to be good stuff. Okay? So what Jesus was speaking to was the harshness by which the, a man could just simply divorce his wife. The, the, the vulnerability it created for the woman in that circumstance. See, Jesus was speaking to, to the, 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 the circumstance created by the divorce, not the divorce. Not the divorce. What happens after that? You have a class of vulnerable people. People that don't have any say-so about what goes on with them. They have no control, over, no agency in their own life. Okay? Jesus is speaking to that. They brought about the divorce. He's speaking about vulnerable people. And so then he goes on to say, Moses gave you that because of your hard hearts. That should convict everybody in this room, including me. Because all of us, everybody I've ever met, has a hard heart about something. 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 We have a set opinion. We have a set set of beliefs. We're firm about it. We're holding to it. And an earthquake won't shake us off of it. A volcano might make us move. But we're not giving up our beliefs. We, we are hard about our beliefs. And hardened hearts, I just want, to, want you to know, hardened hearts can only be softened by a willingness to let God do it. As long as we maintain a hard heart, we're stuck. Because, see, our hearts get hard by our choices. Free will causes hard hearts. God does not create hard hearts. God doesn't make us that way. There's an argument in some circles that, well, God made me this way. If you're living a sinful life, God did not make you that way. Got news for you. Because that's the second thing. What did Jesus say? In the beginning, God made them male and female. God instituted marriage in the beginning. God had a plan, and he made his plan perfectly clear. That in case humans didn't get it, he replicated it throughout nature. Okay? In case we didn't get it, God made his plan known by replicating it through nature. All the animals, the fishes, the birds, the reptiles, male and female, God made them that way. So God had a plan, and humans came along and interrupted it. By their hard hearts, they asked Moses to allow men to write a certificate of divorce. Hard hearts did that. And then Jesus goes back and explains it to his disciples. They said, what does that mean exactly, what you were saying out there, Jesus? And he says, that when a man divorces his wife to go marry another, he commits adultery against his first wife. Likewise, when a woman divorces her husband, she commits adultery against him. Now, you need to understand how unheard of that was in the Jewish culture. Women couldn't divorce their husbands. They could only be divorced, but they couldn't divorce. Now, in the Greco-Roman world of the day, women could divorce their husbands. Imagine that. Outside of the Jewish realm, women could divorce their husbands. So this wasn't unheard of in the world. It was just unheard of in Jewish circles. But Jesus made it equal. If man has a right to do it, then woman has a right to do it. Jesus just said it. But if either one of them does it for the purpose of marrying another, that's not good. 
And we all know that in the vulnerable category of people, most often the, the man is the physical abuser. Did y'all know that most often the woman is the emotional and mental abuser? So see, it goes both ways. It goes both ways. So what will we say about a man that was emotionally or mentally abused and his wife divorced him and shoots him to the curb and he's out there a broken person? He's broke. Not financially. His heart's broken. His mind's broken. His spirit's broken. He's vulnerable. Or how about a, a, a other vulnerable people? How about the person that just starts out drinking because it's popular at college? By the time they leave college, they're drinking daily, all the time. By the time they're 30, they're a full-blown alcoholic, been through two or three wives, have kids, a bunch of jobs. Now they can't drink, quit drink if they want to. And if they've lost a bunch of jobs and lost everything they ever owned, what would be the point of quitting drinking? They're vulnerable too because something has broken them. Addicts the same way. What about the people that are, they get caught up running with the wrong group of people and they get locked up? They come out of prison, they have a record. They're broken too. How do they get back on their feet? How do all these people get back on their feet? How do all of these people have a life where they can stand up and look life in the face and be able to, to stand their own two feet and not be looked down upon, not castigated, not tossed out, not shunned. Whether well, you're talking about the women that had no say-so about their divorce or the broken man or the addict or alcoholic or the convict or put whatever you want in the blank. There are people that are broken by circumstances that they can't control. Because once you go from a drinker to an alcoholic, it's like a, a cucumber going to a pickle. Once it's been pickled, it'll never be a cucumber again. There is no going back. No matter what you started out where you had choice, at some point, if it's bad for you, it will break you. And when it breaks you, now you fall into that class of vulnerable. Vulnerable. Now, just for the record, we hear a lot about vulnerable people today. And I just want to tell you that in that class of vulnerable people does not include people that are openly in rebellion against God, that are openly living sinful lives and proud of it. Those are not vulnerable people. Those are rebellious people. So be careful what you read about who's vulnerable and who's not. Jesus is talking about vulnerable people, and I hope you understand what I'm talking about, about people that are broken by life, things they don't have any say-so, or they reach a place where they no longer have agency, and then they're broken. Those are vulnerable people. But people who make life choices and continue to live that way, even in the face of, of the fact that it's a sin, and they're not trapped chemically by drugs or alcohol, but they openly, pridefully celebrate their sin. That's not vulnerable people. So don't be tricked by that. And there's another thing I read about this week. Modern theologians, see, I had this theory about modern theologians, especially the ones that have written the last 40 years or so. Because Jesus Christ, God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, has been studied so much in the last 2,000 years there are a bazillion number of hours of brain power put into the study of Scripture, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And modern theologians are trying to find a place where they can sell books, keep their tenure, you know, justify their, the doctor on their name after the reverend. And they're trying to come up with something new to be different. Instead of just telling the gospel story, and this is the beautiful thing about John Wesley that we're studying in our Wesley study, is John Wesley's main thing was trying to keep the gospel simple for everyday people. It didn't have to be all gussied up and over-intellectualized. And, and, and you got to sort through all this and have this Ph.D. and beyond to be able to understand all these nuances. That's not true. Jesus came to make it simple for us. We're sinners. We're broken people. 
Life has beat us up, and we need help. And that's why Jesus came. We can confess our need, confess our sin, repent, accept what Jesus did on the cross through his passion, death, and resurrection, accept that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father, just like we say each week in our creed, and we allow the Holy Spirit to work on us, to help pull the sin out of our life, and to cre- let God, through the Holy Spirit, create us back into the image of God, because we are far from the image of God, because we were born into a broken world. The aggregated sin of all the parents before us and all the people that lived with them, that sin is all aggregated, and it's still aggregating. Folks all around us are building up the sin pile in the world, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Is it any wonder it's harder and harder to follow Jesus today? Sometimes it seems like the the sin's winning, and Jesus is losing. Unfortunately for some people, in their lives, it's true. But we have the hope of the one. And Jesus tells us today, let people come to me like children. And I was thinking about that. Aren't children, until they get to a certain age, aren't they really like pretty easy to be contrite? I mean, if they do something wrong and you call them on it, they're, I'm sorry. They're willing to accept correction, right? They're like, their minds are like blank slates. Their their sponges ready to absorb. They want the good information. They want the right stuff. They want to please mom and dad. They want to do the good things. And they're open. Oh, I did something wrong. Okay, well, how am I supposed to do it? That's the mindset of children that Jesus is talking about. When we understand that life is doing to us what life does to people, and we reach that place of acceptance of our vulnerability, we accept that our hardness of heart sometimes gets in the way of us being able to accept what God wants us to do. You know, usually you can find that pretty easy. It's that part that you step out of your relationship with God and say, oh, I got this, God. This is all me. I got this. That's where the hard stuff is. That's where your hardened heart's at, okay? So when you get back into the life with God, you leave that out there. God wants you to bring that in so he can work on it. But when we come with that contriteness, Oh, I did that wrong? Help me to do it right. Teach me how I'm supposed to do it. That's the way Jesus wants us to come to him. But then there's those folks around us. Oh, don't do that. Don't bother Jesus with that. Oh, that's what the disciples did. Don't bother Jesus with your kids. Humans getting in the way of people trying to go to Jesus. How many times, and everybody here probably has a story, maybe you remember it now, maybe you remember it on the way home, you remember it this week, but we all know in our own lives or somebody else's life where somebody was earnestly trying to reach out to Jesus or something, and somebody said, oh, don't worry about that. God doesn't really care about that. That's probably not that bad. At least you're not killing somebody. It's not one of the Ten Commandments. It's not that bad. But to you it was. That's why you were going to take it to Jesus. And somebody's getting in the way between you and God by saying, oh, don't worry about that. Do you know why people tell you not to worry about that? Or why people get in the way between a seeker and God? It's because they got stuff. And they don't want to let go of their stuff. And so if they get you to hang on to your stuff, then they can justify hanging on to their stuff and everybody's got stuff until we're all even. Anybody going to argue with that? I didn't think so. I know I can't argue with it. So when somebody is telling people or a person or worse that they don't have to worry about this sin or that sin, it usually means they're hiding something of their own. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 7 about that. If you think somebody's teaching you falsely, just look at their fruit. Are they running around doing stuff like what they're telling you not to worry about? 
that you are worried about, and that's why you wanted to take it to Jesus? Oh, you can see their fruit. Or how about when it's a preacher or a bishop? What about their fruit? Is their church growing or is it dying? If the church is dying, you see their fruit. If the denomination is dying, you see their fruit. If we're going to be a growing congregation, one, we have to let our fruit be seen. All of it, including the stuff we got to work on, because we need to encourage each other to be, always be working on our stuff and recognize that we all got stuff, okay? So remember the plank and the splinter part, okay? We all got stuff. It's not a question of who's got what stuff. It's a question of we all got it. We need to encourage each other to let Jesus help us through with it. Get out of God's way. Let God work on each of us. All of us become willing and support each other through that willingness. Don't say, oh, don't worry about that. Say, can I pray for you about something? How about that? How many times has somebody asked you to, to pray and let you pray for them and you didn't think they cared? If somebody asked you, can I pray for you about something? Do you think they care? At least a little bit? I do. Friends, we got a lot of work before us. As disciples of Christ, as children of God, and as people who are trying to build a church in a world that seems daily to be more and more opposed to God. We got a lot of work to do. And if we can't work together, with God, it won't happen. And if we get in the way of what God's doing, it won't happen. So can we get out of God's way in our own lives and in the lives of others and in the life of our church and let God do what God wants to do? Let us step up and be conscious of who the vulnerable people are even in our midst because there's brokenness in this room. It's not all out on the street. It's right here. We got it too. God wants to help all of us. He just wants us to recognize our need and recognize the needs of others so we can step up when God calls us to. So this week, just ask yourself, are we in God's way? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.